All right, guys, welcome back to Mac 2320. We are rolling through chapter 30 here. And, you know, all along so far, every single lecture we've talked about is, you know, pretty much how are we starting the motor up? You know, all the different methods to start it. Uh, now we're going to get into how we actually, you know, stop the motor or slow the motor down. So we're going to start talking about uh, braking because it's got to be able to slow down and stop. All right, so we're going to talk about, you know, a few different methods here. We're going to talk about mechanical braking, dynamic braking, and plugging uh, as a method of braking. All right, so the two major types that we're going to talk about are our drum brakes and disc brakes. Those are also on your vehicles, okay? So, you know, generally you'll have maybe disc brakes in the back or drum brakes. I'm sorry, uh, disc brakes in the front, drum brakes go in the back. It kind of depends on if you got a truck or something that might be four-wheel drive versus if you have an automatic car, it might be all disc brakes. Uh, just kind of depends uh, but you know two different types of drum brakes and it'll make sense kind of as we look uh, at a few pictures here but drum brakes use brake shoes and they apply uh, you know pressure against a drum all right and we use a solenoid uh, to be able to do that so how the solenoid works is uh, when we turn the motor on all right the solenoids energize which releases the brake pressure all right or on the shoes uh, it releases that pressure and then when we apply the brake, it actually uh, disconnects the uh, solenoid and puts the pressure uh, back on the drum, okay? Uh, disc uh, brakes work relatively the same way almost. Uh, we use brake pads on a disc though, so a spinning disc. So if you ever take like your front tires off and you look and you see your disc brakes, you know, you have brake pads and brake shoes. You hear them on the commercial, but remember shoes only go to drums, pads only go to disc brakes. Uh, mechanical advantage, of uh, using drum or disc brakes, okay, is that they can actually hold a suspended load in place. So very strong mechanical advantage there. A lot of those like drum brakes use those in cranes and, and heavy equipment uh, and things like that. So they're able to actually maintain, you know, the friction to hold something in place. So if we take a look here, all right, we can see the two pictures here. Uh, this is just, you know, kind of how it goes in your car, but it's a good visualization of what's going on and how the pressure is applied. Okay, so if we look on the left, that's a disc brake, and you can clearly see where the pads are. They're under the red right there, and that's what you, you need to replace, uh, you know, when you get your brakes checked or, or things like that, because it literally rides around on the, on the rotor, all right, which is connected to your bearing, which is connected to your shaft. Okay, and what it really does is you're applying pressure on the rotor uh, when you squeeze the, the disc brake. Okay, and then if we look at the drum brake on the right, okay, we can clearly see where the drum is and you can see how where we would release. Okay, now this one's a little bit different because you also have, you know, like a parking brake. Uh, uh, you can see where the spring is for that, but there you can see how uh, it clicks down and we put the pressure on the drum, all right, to get our mechanical friction to slow it down. All right, if we take a look at it, you know, a more physical view, all right, we can take a look. This is a cutout kind of of a, of a drum brake, as you can kind of see on the side. So notice that they're on the, the outside of the shaft there. You can see where the drums, this is a better, this is a better picture here. So if we take a look at the drum, okay, and then you have the brake shoes that sit on the outside. It really just squeezes those brake shoes on the outside of the drum, and the drum sits on the shaft, okay? And then you can adjust it accordingly. Uh, it's kind of similar to the prony brake that you use in the mechanical class, okay? Uh, in the fluid power class, we talked about using pneumatic brakes, uh, so you can kind of see what those might look like, and then a hydraulic disc brake for a conveyor, all right? We can use disc brakes that are really, really large. All right, so as it turns, right, and the the pads sit on it and squeeze onto the, the disc. So, you know, how does this work? Uh, you know, from a schematic standpoint, very important in this class, I think you guys know by now that we need to understand how all these work. But remember, look, what it, look at the brake solenoid here. So when the motor's turned on, okay, so if you read this, remember we gotta read like left to right, top to bottom. So if we start at the top, we got our control transform, we got a fuse, we got our e-stop sitting in there that's normally wired closed, and we got our start button. When we press the start button, what happens? The motor coil energizes and both of the motor contacts close. Okay, so you can see both motor contacts would close, which would do what? Turn on the brake solenoid. So remember that's important. 
the brake solenoid keeps the pressure off. Okay, it keeps the pressure um, off the uh, the uh, cylinder or the cylinder, the shaft, to keep it from turning. Okay, or the disc or whatever you're on. It keeps it off the drum, keeps it off the disc. Sorry, uh, with the flow there, my thoughts. But um, so what happens is when the motor turns off, right? When you hit the stop button, what happens is is that solenoid okay, turns off and allows the friction to go back onto the shaft or the drum and slow the motor down. It's very imperative that we stop a motor because a motor can become a generator. All right, so there's different ways of doing this and you don't want everything to go back through the system and for it to generate electricity. Okay, so that was disc and uh, drum method of braking. This is dynamic braking. Okay, so when we use dynamic braking, we're using it to slow uh, alternating current motors. Okay. For the most part, we're using what we call, we deem it like magnetic braking, all right? So you actually use the magnetic field to slow down the rotation of the rotor. So there is no mechanical friction involved here. So uh, there's no brake shoes, there's no pads, uh, any of those sort of things. The disadvantage to dynamic braking is that it can't hold the suspended load, all right? But we can apply a magnetic field all right, to slow down that rotor, so an external field, so like a giant solenoid uh, coil around it or something along those lines, okay? You can also do it for direct current motors, and I'm gonna step back a slide, because that's why I had a train on there, all right? Um, those are all running off of DC, all right? So they're all electrical. Um, you have, you know, diesel engines, but the diesel is there to more or less be a generator of electricity and when actually the motors are actually running the train, they're electric motors, okay? So if we do dynamic braking for current direct current or DC motors, right? Same kind of concept. We're changing the magnetic field to slow it down, okay? But we can do this. And in this essence, we actually change that motor into a generator when we're doing DC. So what's gonna happen here is we're gonna have power remain connected to the shunt field. Uh, when the motor stop and then we're going to reconnect it to the armature uh, using a high watt resistor okay so this is what that looks like you know from a general standpoint you can see how the disc is on it and then how we create the magnetic field around it all right we have a coil of wire just like we do everything else we put a current through that coil of wire that coil of wire creates the electromagnetic field which slows that disc down okay so uh, essentially, it's kind of, you know, if you've ever looked inside your house where you might see one of those in your old um, electrical panels, you might see something similar to this. It's kind of rotating around. Okay. So here's where that goes on the schematic. All right. So we have our braking resistor uh, that goes across there. So the reason we have that wrist, the resistor across there, okay, we generally make it a variable resistor. It might be multiple resistors, but we can adjust the resistance. All right, once it's placed into shunt, we can adjust that resistance to actually control the braking speed. So that's what that resistor is doing. It's controlling, you know, um, you know, if we really want to apply the brakes or if we want to gradually apply the, uh, apply the brakes to make it uh, slow down. Okay, so that's what that's on there for. Okay, if we want to look at, you know, more in depth on the alternate on the AC motors, right, alternate, alternating current. All right, so what are we going to do with this case? We can connect direct current or DC current to the stator winding. Okay, remember the stator's the outside of the, uh, the field, okay, where the rotor is on the inside. Okay, so when you do that connection, it causes the uh, magnetic field to maintain a constant polarity. So what does that mean if we have constant polarity? Well, uh, when I showed you in class, what will happen is since that polarity is not changing, the motor is actually not going to rotate well. It's going to be constantly stuck in kind of like a north on one side, south on the other. So since the polarity is no longer rotating, okay, the, so we're sending that into the stator. Since the polarity is no longer rotating, the rotor on the inside is not going to rotate either. It's going to lock in. All right, so uh, I've shown you in class where I have that little DC motor in my hand and I actually have to like turn it perpendicular to even get it started. It's kind of the same thing like that. It cannot overcome the, the preset magnetic field there to slow it down. Okay, so how does that happen? 
Uh, we can notice up here on the power diagram, remember whenever we see four diodes like that, that's always a rectifier. Rectifying meaning we are going AC to DC. That's what rectifying is. Okay, so we're going to go through the step down transformer. We're going to rectify it. We're going to have our current limiting resistor there. Okay, that's so we can control speed uh, as well. So when we put that current in, okay, based on you know how much current we put through there, we could put a whole bunch of current. So it would really lock it into like a north-south pole, or we can kind of vary the current so the poles are much bigger and the field they're knocking off of, so it'll start to slow that down uh, as well. So that's kind of how we use dynamic braking there for AC and DC. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about uh, plugging a motor. Okay. So uh, when we're going to plug a motor, it's kind of you know, kind of doesn't seem theoretically sound all the time because uh, this is a system of braking and where we're going to actually reverse the connections all right so the motor gets a counter torque so if we're going forward we're going to break it by reversing uh, the direction okay and kind of actually making it a generator almost in that case but we're using we're reversing the direction because it's going to create the counter torque and that counter torque will actually start to slow that force down it uses the word retarding force it's a slowing retard is to slow down okay so it's using a, a slowing force there so the most common motors these are used all right are three phase uh, induction squirrel cage motors so that's what we're doing this you can also do manual plugging okay so an operator can stand at the machine all right and literally uh, make it break as it needs to by plugging it just you know changing the direction of the rotor so we get a change in torque okay so if we look at it schematically all right so this is what manual plugging looks like right here so notice we don't have to stop the motor what is happening is you know it's it's kind of overcoming there's still a mechanical interlock right you can see that that's physically on here but for it to go forward that's a normally closed push button and then if we go over and we actually hit that push button What's it going to do? It's going to push down and lower the contact on the reverse. Okay, so that's plugging. That's how we're breaking it. Okay, we're not trying to stop the motor here. We're just applying, you know, a slight breakage to it. So we're going to almost, it's not going to like throw it into full on, you know, reverse where you're going to break your neck sort of thing. But as you do that, all right, and it makes that connection, it will slow it down and put it in the opposite direction. Because remember, this isn't a mechanical stop. So mechanical stops can give you more of an instantaneous stop. So like your, your brakes, um, where you have, we talked about disc brake and your drum brake, okay? Those use friction. Those are gonna be more instantaneous, okay? Now this is fast, but this isn't using friction and you're not gonna use these to suspend a load either, okay? This is for if you need to brake kind of on the go, all right? And you're, so you're gonna be plunging it along. Okay, we can also do it with timer uh, control as well, okay? So we have an on-delay timer here that kicks in uh, for that to start up as well. So you can plug it, or plug, plug it, all right, or plugging it, all right, and we can push that. And notice when we push that, it turns on the timer relay. And um, sorry, I keep saying on-delay. This is an off-delay, all right, off-delay. So remember the, the off delay timer is uh, the one pointing down. So this is, this is using the off delay timer. So um, we can use the manual control here or we can use a timing control uh, to do that. So in this case, we're using an off delay timer. Uh, so if you hit the plugging or plugging, right? Where we're pushing down and we're switching it to reverse for a second, all right? we can use a timer to finite tune that. There are some timer or issues with the, uh, the time delay to actually uh, use it with plugging. All right, so if you set, if the timer's not set for a long enough amount of time, uh, the reversing circuit can, all right, can open before the motor completely stops. So if the timer is set too long, the motor will reverse direction, okay? And that's not necessarily what you want to do. So you got to be a lot more careful when you're using the time delay because we don't when we're doing you know plugging we don't want the motor to completely stop and completely go in reverse we just want it on long enough to get enough counter torque 
all right, to slow it down. And you remember, it's breaking. So you have to be very careful about using it when you use the time delay because it can actually stop and go the opposite direction and screw everything up for you. We only want it to be plugging for a specific amount of time just as we need breaking to happen. All right, so hopefully that concept kind of makes uh, sense to you. All right, guys, uh, end of uh, lecture. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. Let me know if we need to uh, Zoom meet or team meet or anything else like that. Else, guys, have a great day. I'll see you in class.